So just a quick, a quick um, update on webinar etiquette. So please, can everybody during this morning's session, if you can please mute your microphones. Uh, um, for everybody, can you also switch off your cameras when not speaking? Please, we ask uh, not to interrupt the speakers. We're going to ask for questions to be put through the chat group. So uh, we have Mary on uh, on the webinar with us this morning. She's our IT uh, expert who will have uh, been in contact with you all previous to this morning. So if there's any uh, issues, Mary is on the line for for to help us out. So if all questions can be uh, added into the chat group, please. And what we'll do is we're going to go through all of the questions at the end of the presentations. Just to let everybody know that we are recording this session. And uh, again, after this morning's session, Mary is going to email everybody with a feedback survey just to ask for any feedback on the particular session and topic this morning. Just a quick rundown of the agenda. So we have uh, speakers from across the uh, supply chain sector this morning. Uh, I myself am with 3CE. I'm giving an introduction to the webinar and to the H4.0 project. The rundown then of the speakers, we have John White, Merritt Bushell, James Mason, Paul Glavin, David Gall, Joe Fitzgerald and Susan McGarry. So those are our speakers. We're going to have about an hour uh, and 20 minutes of presentations, 10 minutes each. Um, after that, as I said, we're going to have our questions and answer session and then we're going to have a virtual discussion on the long term sustain sustainability and engagement within the industry. The aim is to have uh, the webinar uh, completely wrapped up by half past 11, so it's a two hour session. Just to give everybody a quick rundown of ourselves, we're the Three Counties Energy Agency. We're a not-for-profit independent energy agency. We're based in Kilkenny City. We work primarily in the three counties of Carlow, Kilkenny and Wexford. We work uh, in the energy efficiency, renewable, uh, low carbon uh, uh, sector. We work with community groups, SMEs, industry, uh, in the domestic sector, uh, public and private. So we, 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 work, uh, uh, we, we work with anybody who wants to uh, save energy and, and, and lower the carbon emissions. So that's, that's, that's who we are. Uh, as I said, our office is based in Kilkenny. We work on a number of EU projects um, that allows us to, to, to uh, achieve our, our strategy and our targets. So this is one of our projects. Housing 4.0 is a, as I've mentioned, an Interreg Northwest Europe project. It's the uh, advancement of the affordable and sustainable new build modular low carbon life cycle housing using 4.0 digitization techniques. In other words, to simplify, <laughs> um, it's a project that aims to reduce the cost of housing units by 25% and to reduce carbon emissions both embodied and on operational carbon emissions by 60%. So that's the overall aim of this project. There are partners across um, six different EU countries there, and you can see them on the map. So how are we uh, hoping to achieve this? There are three main areas that we're looking at throughout this project with the various partners uh, that we're working with. Firstly, we're looking at creating a digital platform. So the replication and uh, of the designs and models. So every time, uh, you know, a, a new housing, uh, a new house or a new housing estate or a new development by the, uh, by the local authorities, housing association, private developers, um, has to go through the, 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 the same kind of design stage. So by having these, plat uh, the, these designs uh, available on, the, on a digital platform, we would hope that the replication of those designs are already uh, in existence um, and that will help with the replication of them. Low energy design, obviously we're looking at NZEB standards, passive house standards, low energy standards, low energy uh, and low carbon. Looking at different materials, so low embodied energy materials such as timber frame, low carbon eco uh, cement, etc. Electrification of heating, renewable integration, and, uh, and, and, and any new technologies who are going to assist with that. So obviously the low energy design. And then we're also looking at the logistics and procurement. So rapid build, looking at the rapid build framework, any other kind of new procurement models out there, off-site manufacturing, uh, local 
manufacturing, local contractors, local supply, because obviously the less transportation, the lower the, the, the carbon emissions. Again, just to, to, to reiterate, it's embodied uh, carbon uh, emissions, not just the operational. So it's both, we're looking at the whole life cycle cost of building homes. In other words, what we want to do is we want to design for manufacture. And we want to design for local manufacture. And we want to design for assembly. And just to simplify this, what we mean is what, when we talk about the design for manufacture and assembly techniques, we're all aware, I think, of how a car is, is, is made. All of the different parts are, 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 are made, put together, assembled in the production, uh, in the assembly, um, uh, on the assembly line and out, at, at the end you spit out your car you've got your product at the end exactly the same way I think I'm not sure if I know anybody who hasn't uh, uh, used or put together a piece of IKEA furniture but in exactly the same way we're, we're all I think very aware of IKEA furniture or, or similar all, all uh, um, assembly products so you get your different materials it's all flat pack you bring it home and you put it all together and at the end of the day You've got your product. So this is all designed for manufacture and assembly. And the aim here is to look at houses. Can we do that? And how can we do that here? Um, uh, looking at housing, building houses in exactly the same way. The digital platform that we're looking at for this particular project uh, is hopefully going to allow us to do that. So what we're here today to talk about is, is how can we get all of these individual parts uh, materials and assembly pieces together in such a way that somebody can use the digital platform and design their house. Not only that, but have an idea of what the cost of that house is going to be and what the energy consumption and carbon uh, output emissions of that house is going to be. So that's the aim of the project and that's what we're here to talk about. With this project, we have three sub partners, which are the, our three local authorities uh, within the three counties uh, region. Wexford, Carlow and Kilkenny County Councils. Each of them are building four units within this project. So we have four pilot projects or houses being built in the three areas. So a, a block of apartments being built in Wexford County Council, two, uh, two semi-detached bungalows in Carlow and in Kilkenny we have a mix. There's one apartment block with two units and one semi-detached bungalow. So those are the three pilot projects that we have within this project. Um, using the H4O techniques and models that we are looking at and we, that we are trying to develop. So really the aim again of this morning's supply chain workshop is awareness, number one, awareness. Make everybody in the supply chain, every, make, make everybody out there aware that this digital platform is in uh, 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 development. Make you aware of the potential for replication. So we are working with the, not only our three pilot local authorities, but with the uh, local, all local authorities with the Housing Association um, of Ireland. And the rep potential for replication um, is, is uh, we feel extremely significant, uh, working with the Department of Housing as well. Not only with, across the social housing sector, but once this is up and running, some of our other partners are actually working with private homeowners and private developers um, in, in Holland, uh, the pilot project is, is working with 40 individual homeowners. So, so the potential out there is, is, uh, is, is, is immense. Also awareness for the necessity for using non-fossil products. So reducing our energy emissions, but our carbon emissions as well, not only by the way we um, uh, build our homes and use our homes, but by the materials that we're using. Uh, to make uh, the suppliers aware, if you want to be uh, part of this platform, you need to give us your product information. And again, that's what we're going to talk about later. How do we get certified products on the platform? And from the supply chain, about uh, we have speakers today who are going to tell us about their products and about their approach to the market, their approach to uh, near zero energy designs, and their approach to digitization of construction and prefabrication. So that's a brief uh, introduction from myself on the project and on the aim of this morning's uh, uh, webinar. So I'm just going to pass you on to our first speaker, uh, John White from the uh, BRE group, who's going to talk about the construct, uh, digitization of construction. Thanks, Alex. Uh, morning, everybody. 
Um, just hopefully you can see my screen there and hear me loud and clear. Can't see your screen yet, John. Oh. You see it now? Hello, can you see it now? No. no. Not yet, John. Bear me one second, sorry. Yeah, there we okay? go. Yeah, perfect. Uh, morning, Alex. Good morning. morning, everybody. Um, many thanks to 3CEA for inviting myself and my colleague David Gall to speak today. Um, just going to give you a quick overview to um, who BRER. Um, sorry for some reason. Uh, why we're in Ireland and then do some of the work we're doing in the UK through the UK government funded project called the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, so BRE effectively are a multidisciplinary building science organisation involved in the built environment. So we look at everything from cradle to grave on a built environment, so anything from a house right through to a commercial office retail building. And that may involve education and training through to testing and certification of a building, through to ultimately fire investigation and defect of buildings as well. Um, for the first 80, 90 years, it was a government test laboratory set up in 1921 in North Watford in a place called Garson. So um, that was basically government owned until the late 1990s. So from a construction perspective, for example, we developed the first standard for bricks in the UK that became ultimately an internationally recognized standard. And then in 1997, the organization became privatized, privatized under the ownership of the BRE Trust. So the BRE Trust is actually the largest UK registered charity. It's not for profit organization. Um, but within that then we have a number of subsidiaries. So BRE Ireland, UK, China, all commercial in nature, all there to generate profit, but most importantly, the profit goes back into the BRE Trust for investment in education and training, for research and development into building regulations and standards, and effectively improving the built environment. So for example, from an academic perspective, we would fund a lot of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, uh, research programs across the UK, Ireland, and overseas. Um, I suppose what's our mission statement, what we do we believe in, and it's really looking at new and better ways for both people to live and work in. And obviously health and safety and fire safety is critical, but also looking at it from an affordability perspective, efficient perspective. And I think one thing that gets lost as well is comfort factor, and how do you measure comfort in a building? So we can go on about all new design and what's involved, but comfort, comfort is also a, a huge factor we, we, we kind of gauge and measure as well. Um, from a group expertise perspective, these are kind of the key areas we work on. So for the purpose of today, it'll be primarily focused on innovation and BIM and digitalization. And I know my colleague David Gall will also cover some elements of BIM and digitalization in his presentation. And from a brand perspective, you may be aware of some of these brands, and I won't dwell on too many of them, but Briam, for example, is a beer rerun scheme, which is basically the environmental assessment methodology for buildings. And LPCB is basically the installer scheme for manufacturers of fire doors, fire shutters, and sprinkler design companies that is put into buildings. And again, that's a globally recognized qualification. Um, we're in 80 countries around the world. We've trained over 35,000 people across areas like fire, sustainability, BIM. Um, and I suppose who our clients are. So our, our client base is quite diversified. We work with both national and local government agencies, local authorities. We work with a lot of third level institutions and also in Ireland quite, quite, with quite a number of the Institute of Technologies or TU colleges as well. And then from an industry perspective, we work across property, construction and manufacturing. So for example, companies in Ireland we work with the likes of Sangaban, Sisk and Kingspan. Um, why we're in Ireland, and it's one main reason, is because of Brexit. Um, because we are a testing and certification body, it meant that if we had to provide C marking post-Brexit environment, we had to be based A in an EU country, be accredited in that country, and also have car testing carried out in that country as well. So since the end of 2017, we're based in DCU Alpha, and we're accredited in Ireland for the C marking of construction products, marine equipment, and transport and pressure equipment. And we are in the process of also planning a local fire test facility here as well, and that will probably come on stream at some stage in 2021. But we also, from a group perspective, also develop a lot of education training programs here, and also offsite, and, and David, as I said, they will, will speak about that further in his presentation. Um, from an innovation perspective, then, this is very closely linked to the work we're doing in the UK and internationally. Um, we have an innovation park network. So here is a snapshot of the innovation park in Watford. So basically what this is are temporary dwellings. So it can only be think from a, a traditional build to a timber frame building to an offsite building. And we go through best design, building practice materials and technology in that building. And 
very importantly, that technology and that, that proof of concept is scalable into commercial, retail and office buildings as well. And we have innovation parks around the world, as far afield as China, the continent of America and across the UK. And we are actually in the process of looking at setting up a physical innovation park in Ireland as well. And what's the vision of an innovation park? It's not a standalone physical hub. We, we, we engage with industry, with academic partners to kind of support the development, demonstration, deployment of innovation, what works well, what doesn't work well in a built environment, and what, what we can we do to improve, and what's the benefit to industry, the community, and society as well. And there's a link there to the innovation park, and I would urge you to have a look at that and give you a, a better idea. And that innovation park is very closely linked then to the work we're doing in the UK. So I don't know if many of you have come across uh, the UK project called the Construction Innovation Hub. So this is a project set out about three, three and a half years ago by the government in the UK. And basically, its mission is to be a catalyst for transformation in the UK construction sector through manufacturing technologies, the way we work, the way we bring skilled labor into, into the workplace and into the construction sector. And it's important to say at the outset that the Construction Innovation Hub, while it's UK focused, I think it's gonna have a lot of benefits internationally and probably a lot of best practice being adopted in Ireland and other countries as well. And in fact, we are doing some work here with government around the center of excellence for digital construction as well. And that's what we're doing in the UK, I think would be replicated here as well. So what the Construction Innovation Hub, again, there's a video there, but because of time constraints, probably won't show that to you. But again, there's a three and a half minute video there, kind of gives you an overview of the work that's involved in that. Um, the Construction Innovation Hub was, was UK government funded for about 74 million sterling. Through a procurement process, they appointed three parties, the Manufacturing Technology Centre, the Centre of Digital for Built Britain in, uh, through the University of Cambridge and BRE. And the objective of it is four core, core teams, and that's what I'll focus on for the rest of the presentation. And if you look at the left-hand side there, we're looking at value, manufacturing, assurance, and digital. And through a kind of twin output, a physical and digital twin, the idea is that we're going to look at how we build buildings better from an economic value perspective, from an environmental perspective, but also what the social impact of construction is as well. So we can go on about all new design and what type of building technology we use, but the social impact is just as imperative as the environmental and economic impacts. So Alex, you mentioned earlier on about the design for manufacturing assembly. So the UK infrastructure and, and um, project authority have called for a project-based approach to this. And what I mean by that is, or sorry, a platform-based approach. And what I mean by a platform-based approach is that we will use a set of digitally designed components across the multiple types of built asset and apply those components where possible. And if that is done correctly, it'll minimize the need to design bespoke components for different types of the asset. And that's what we're trying to achieve through the hub. So manufacturing is a really key component, but really importantly, um, we must recognize that a technical solution for this is not, will not alone deliver a true transformation. We also need to develop frameworks for value, assurance, and, and, and most importantly as well, digital. So from a value perspective, um, we are developing a value framework for government and clients and industries in the UK that's going to inform and also improve investment decisions and procurement process as well. So um, that's currently work in progress. From an assurance perspective, and this is very critical to BRE as well as a testing and certification body, is, is, is giving confidence to industry. So having this kind of single source of truth for products and materials that somebody can go and say, yes, th these products and materials meet the performance criteria. So that's going to be underpinned by developing testing and certification and um, giving assurance to the industry and the marketplace. And also, I think one important aspect of this as well, this isn't for free, like it's costing money. So working with financial institutions to ensure there's access to finance and also getting the backing from the insurance industry, from, from the warranties, the guarantors as well. And that's again, part of this, of this project with the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, in terms of, of digital, um, we're developing obviously a digital framework um, to set out what data is required to, to improve and make better decisions. Um, and this will be underpinned by um, the next phase is BIM standards. So some of you may be aware, there's a new range of BIM ISO 19650 standards. So that will form part of this as well. And also we're working with the, um, the University of Cambridge to, in terms of the development of a national digital twin. And again, to reiterate what I said earlier on, we believe that also would have um, positive um, repercussions for Ireland in terms of a national digital twin in Ireland as well. Um, John, one minute. Thank you. 
nearly there. Um, so we're, we're developing a, an ecosystem. We're also developing an information management system as well as part of this framework. Um, but also as well, we need to show, and I mentioned it very slightly there about the economic value. So one of the things we're looking at is also developing what the economic value is and, and, and showing empirical evidence and case studies to develop that. And then finally, I suppose, what's the output of all of this? Like, it's all good talking about the work we're doing, but one of the things is defining a digital ecosystem, developing a digital transformation roadmap. And finally, um, you know, as I said to you, accelerating this program at this, at this critical time, developing a technical solution, but also ensuring value is created, there's a better social environment, and also sustainable transformation in the sector. And final slide here is, like, what, what will this look like in the future? Obviously, we're looking at, at safer and higher quality buildings using less energy. But I think one of the other key things here that sometimes get lost is, is bringing new skill sets into the sector and attracting more people into the sector. And that is right down to, to secondary schools, right through the education and training boards, right through third level institu institutions. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, John. If I could just remind everybody, if they have any questions for John, to put them into the Zoom uh, group chat there. If uh, everybody can access that, if there's any specific questions, um, please put them up. Our next speaker is Merit. Merit, if you'd like to share your screen, please. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the um, experience that we've had tried to we're, we're working on um, none of this is really directly related to housing um we're architects uh Buholtz McAvoy architects we work on we're working on a pretty large housing project of 500 units um for dublin city council as of recently but um which will involve a lot of this kind of thing but really where we learned about um digital fabrication and um the whole process of, um, of integrating um, the digital platform into low energy design and procurement and logistics was a project that we did for Johnson & Johnson, um, which is a maker of contact lenses um, in, in they have a factory in Limerick. They have a very complicated process um, that involved, um, let's say, the assembly of components from around the world to make these frames, these uh, kind of production, these, uh, I, I suppose they're kind of, um, people list factories um, that produce uh, contact lenses and they produce uh, the global supply of contact lenses 60% uh, of it comes out of the factory in Limerick so anyway uh, it's really important to get these machines up and running quickly um, and uh, the process of putting them together because it involves a very an enormous supply chain of um, companies from you know Japan and Switzerland and Germany and the UK and, and, and obviously there's some local companies that are quite strong in, in, in Shannon in particular in, in, out in the, the industrial uh, park near the airport. Um, it's a complex process. So we really got to know the DFM, the digital design for manufacture process working with J&J. &J. Um, and I can, um, let's see here. So you can see some of the kind of complicated uh, components, which we broke down into simplified, tried to break down into simple kind of um, simple things that we could we could 3D print. A lot of the problem was trying to understand, you know, how engineers and uh, other uh, manufacturing manufacturing industry are kind of integrating their systems and products. So to break these complicated things um, using very, let me say, uh, arcane software, um, we started to do a series of 3D models um, using mainly Rhino, um, breaking the thing down into a series of grasshopper scripts, which I think I have, yeah, zones and grasshopper scripts, uh, which we uh, distilled basically into new ways that we could make some of the components much faster than they were making them currently because a lot of the components were made, you know, it's a kind of an amalgam of things that are made uh, by machines, but also things that are made by hand. And we were trying to figure out, okay, well, what are the things that we can make most efficiently by hand? And what are the things we can make, make, make most efficiently by machine? So um, this is pretty interesting because one of the, one of the, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of, frames that we, projects that we were working on um, was, uh, was, was constructed. Um, and I just want to flip into uh, kind of the architecture side of things. So at that time, um, let's see, can you see my screen still? Yes, we can, yes. Yep, we're good. Okay, so <clears throat> you should have an image of, yeah. So 
Oops, Daisy. Uh, so we were working uh, just just before that. We had done a mass timber building um, in Balayogan, um, and a lot of the DFM processes were used. We just didn't call them that. We didn't really know that that's what they were. Um, we were using it's a it's a three story office building. Um, in uh, again, this isn't housing, so my apologies for that. Um, but it is uh, kind of interesting because we were using a lot of the processes that we kind of ended up using in the in the in the J and J project, kind of calling them different names. So it's a three story office building, prefabricated timber components. The big issue is lateral stability in in timber frame buildings um, because uh, you know moment connections are complex. So a lot of the uh, planning of this uh, went on between um, ourselves and the and the engineers, and this is one of the models that the that the engineers, in fact, in the timber fabrication company, which is in Austria, was making. But we made a lot of models in our office. So on the right hand side is an image is a model that we made using our uh, laser cutter, and on the left hand side is a model that we made um, mainly by hand. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to kind of start to combine these techniques of digital fabrication with um, handmade things because you need to understand how things are assembled finally, particularly when you're talking about prefabricated timber components that, um, again, are coming from a complex supply chain. So the wood for this building came from, uh, uh, well, it came from, from Scandinavia finally, but it was all tagged through this, uh, uh, this, this uh, from the forest to the factory. You can see the same tech, the, the sort of, you know, laser cutter technology that we use to make our models is pretty much the same thing that BHAG uses uh, to make the uh, cuts in the beams. All of the stuff is kind of simplified down to, um, you know, some very, uh, let me say, efficient connections, um, which can be quickly assembled on site. When I say quickly, I mean really fast. So we had a three-story frame um, that waited for nine months for the concrete cores to, or, you know, kind of rise up. And then in three weeks, uh, the entire frame was done. And because we didn't have any finishes except for the raised access floor, it was basically done, you know, uh, completed uh, almost uh, uh, less than a, uh, three months after the, after the frame went up. So it was, it was really fast. And this is 2010. So we're talking about 10 years ago. So it's not new, it's old. Um, so when, when we employed this in uh, uh, this kind of thinking in, um, in other larger, let me say, kind of complex buildings, this is a, another public building, not all wood, but two kinds of dig two digital uh, fabrication. One is the frame, which is combination of, of, of timber, of, of uh, glue laminated timber beams and uh, uh, hollow core concrete slabs. Um, and then a hook on a prefabricated uh, timber uh, facade. So, you know, all of what you see in that image is, except for the roof uh, kind of uh, pop-ups there, uh, is prefabricated. So the uh, first story uh, of this building is in concrete, which is not prefabricated. Uh, so when I say everything in that image, I mean everything from the in this kind of facade zone. Um, the second story is the, is the is the prefabricated part. And then the facade modules, which were made in, uh, in Longford uh, by an uh, Irish joinery company called GEM, uh, uh, came in 1.5 meter mod 1.5 by up to seven meters high modules that were hooked onto the uh, facade. And we were kind of, again, modeling this between these two um, kind, of, kind of systems. So it's an interesting, it was an interesting example because, you know, obviously we had certain elements from a supply chain perspective, certain elements that were coming from, you know, Austria and uh, uh, via, via Cedarland and Cork, um, certain products that were coming from Ireland, like the precast units and the, and the facade, um, and, and all kind of assembled uh, on site. Now in Toronto, Canada, we're working on a project which is uh, kind of taking all of this maybe slightly to the next level. It's a mass timber building. It's net zero carbon. It's lead platinum. It's uh, well building standard Toronto green building standard version 2.0 uh, Canadian Green Building Society pilot project. It's a lot of, let me say, uh, super things as far as energy goes. It's extremely low energy, even for Toronto, for Canada. You know, this is Ontario, so you've got uh, you know, wintertime temperatures of around about uh, minus, uh, you know, minus 10 to minus 20 and, and summertime temperatures in the, in the high 20s and, and low and well, high 30s sometimes with high humidity. So the building that runs at about uh, not including plug loads, so not including, uh, you know, things you plug in, 
uh, like your mobile phone charger or whatever computers, uh, but including lights and ener and all energy uh, all uh, energy sources of 30, 37 watts per square meter. So it's a very low energy um, office building. It's completely pre prefabricated uh, wood, um, and uh, it's kind of a complex geometry. So you know the Balayogan project that I was showing you before, and the Samuel Beckett project are both, from a geometric perspective, relatively uncomplicated. They're boxes. This is not a box. It's kind of a crystalline geometry. So. From a structural perspective and a, and a DFM perspective, it's rather complicated because the calculations involved in, in making this building are, are a little bit uh, more, more rigorous. The other thing about this building is it's all made out of, the whole thing basically is made out of, of uh, let's call it plants. Um, so the, uh, the only thing that is made out of concrete uh, is the slab. And then after that, you've got a, a timber, timber structure. So cross laminated timber, glue laminated timber, uh, columns and beams and slabs. And then the facade is also made out of prefabricated uh, 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 timber uh, cladding and uh, windows with timber insulation. So there's really, and you know, there's, there's, there's no, um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it is a net zero carbon building. So the, um, yep. The, uh, the, these are some of the models that we made, again, using the same process of our laser cutter fabrication, um, kind of aping, if you like, the uh, fabrication process that they're going to go through in the factory. This project is on site, so I only have to show you is a, is a, a hole in the ground that I decided not to take a pic, not to send a picture of or put a picture of in the presentation. But I do want to point out the uh, structural scheme a little bit. Um, you have uh, the structural engineer with their plan turns this into a series of components. So it's really important, I suppose, to understand suddenly that the whole process of digital fabrication from a, a checking point of view ends up becoming drawings like this, where instead of you're looking at, you know, you're looking at graphs and charts much more than you're looking at actual drawings to check back to see about sizes and dimensions and how they're, how they're coordinated. Um, so lateral stability is a big issue, um, and we have uh, a number of, uh, you can see in the um, uh, uh, image here, we have uh, three cores which are made out of CLT, uh, which provide most of the lateral stability. Then we have uh, internal cross-braced elements and external cross-braced elements to provide the rest of the lateral stability. The final point I want to make is about the supply chain. Canada, Canada um, has uh, about... 9% of the global forest. Ontario has 3% of the global forest. So there's a lot of wood there. However, uh, and this is a big however, uh, mass timber construction uh, is new uh, in Canada. So all, and you can see this is Toronto. So there's not a heck of a lot of timber there, except for this little building here, which is the ninth, well, this building here, which is the 19th century uh, brick and beam building. They have old, you know, barns and stuff like that, but basically all of the wood uh, and the technology is coming from Austria and Sweden and so store in Hasser, and, and Haslacher in, in Austria and store Enzo in, in, in Sweden um, and then being uh, shipped to uh, Toronto and, and erected on site. So these are the drawings that the uh, Blue Band company is providing us with um, and their charts of the same sort of beams and some of the drawings and models that we've made um, as part of the process. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. Just again to remind everybody uh, that there's a chat group. If you've got any specific questions, we'll go through the questions at the end. Uh, James Mason from the Timber Frame Company is next. James, if you'd like to share your screen, thank you. We can't hear you, James. Right, I'm halfway through my presentation, so. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Right, sorry about that. Um, let me just reshare that. Share screen. Right. Perfect. Uh, hi, I'm James Mason from TTFC. We're based down in Wexford. We've been around for, for 22 years now. Um, I've been here 13 years myself, manufacturing throughout the UK and Ireland, UK since 2011. Um, yeah, we've been growing ever since, really. Gone through a few recessions in our time, which is and Brexit, which was a, 
a big kick in the teeth, but anyway, we'll keep moving on with our lives. Um, I suppose, I know Merritt and John, they've, they've touched on it as well yourself, Alex, is the importance of off-site manufacture, timber frame, standardizing uh, designs to become more efficient, especially for social and uh, um, even commercial buildings. Um, with timber frame, it is a very flexible design. We can build, as well as Merritt has just demonstrated, across the world, especially glue lamb, we can build high rise buildings, we can build low rise residential. Um, the Irish regs are a bit restrictive here at the moment, but obviously we're always working as that. Um, with timber frame in Ireland, we're, we're NSAI uh, quality accredited. It's a precision engineered system. It's a fixed cost solution. It's fast and efficient construction system. And we have extensive fire testing now as well as compliance. I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit later. Um, I suppose to touch on the COVID-19 guidelines and offsite manufacturing, a lot of our processes were already in place, which helped it, um, uh, us getting back up and running quite quickly. Obviously, most of our products built offsite. There's less deliveries to sites, so less people approaching. Social distancing is easy to uh, adhere to because most teams fitting a house would be three or four and they're spread throughout the, the, the housing unit. Online meetings as well as electronic drawing approval is already in place. We've already been doing that for years now, which is which made our lives a lot easier uh, coming back and getting back up to full production. Um, I had a quick look at what Ralph sent me and what he wanted me to touch on in terms of how we approach the market and what we can do to help, especially the housing 4.0 um, scheme. So a lot of this is in place already throughout the UK and Ireland and across the world. Obviously, timber frame across the world is very popular or the most popular method of build in Ireland, we've got about 33% of the market share. Now, it's easy for us to replicate social housing designs because it's all done on a PC. So it's very easy to replicate, even adjust to suit what, what the requirements are. Utilizing eco-friendly building materials that are economical as well. Obviously cost is important, which Alex pointed on, a 25% saving in a house building. So, Obviously, one has to help the other. With meeting and separate requirements, I'll show you a couple of case studies there in a few minutes. Digitalization of construction, obviously BIM, which be, uh, John from BRE already touched on as well, is, is very important. I mean, we've, we do a lot of schools in the UK, and what we have to do is, is uh, transfer our file in an IFC model, so the architect or project designer pulls everything into the same model and makes sure the whole system works, which is, is very important. And then give the designer end use the confidence that their design will be built to all required certification requirements. Now, as I mentioned, we're members of the ITFMA and we're also audited by the NSAI and we stick to the IS 440-2009. The last few years, obviously with the new Part B regs coming in, we were asked by the DOE to do some extensive testing. And that's not only in the offsite timber frame manufacturers, there's also in the intermediate floor system, which is which includes engineered I-beams as well as uh, metal web joists, which I'm sure a lot of you have come across, and also uh, roof trusses, uh, pre-manufactured roof trusses. So a lot of testing has been done over the past 18 months. So everything is two building regs at, as built, and that hand in hand with the NSAI guidelines for timber frame construction, what we have to do is stick to those guidelines and that gives you the confidence that everything is certified, everything is checked on a daily basis. We have to have a set up quality control in the factory. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say, a lot of the systems are in place of what you're looking for. Um, it's there ready to go, ready to roll out quite quickly. I mean, within six months, you can have a lot of houses being built, which again, I'll show you a little video later on. These are the four wall types we based on the industry in Ireland, basically. This is the, this is the system. Now, we can develop and, and kind of enhance these a little bit more to use a bit more eco-friendly products. Um, I had a good conversation with two, uh, Ralph and another, uh, Laura, last week about different products we can use, um, including recycled materials, mineral wool, uh, sheep's wool came up, as well as wood fiber products. So hands are tied in little areas, but basically these four walls are ones that we can manipulate as long as we can stick to our fire uh, compliance as well as our NSAI gu guidelines. Um, the next two slides are basically industry standard. 
90% of the manufacturers, I'd say, use these wall types uh, in the ITFMA. So it's easy to roll out the same design to all manufacturers, not just ourselves, um, across the country. I mean, I think it's 18 members of us at the moment. So I think we did 33%, as I mentioned, of the 20, 25,000 units. And it was at seven or 8,000 timber frame units built last year in Ireland. Um, obviously, we do a lot of uh, buildings in the UK, as I mentioned before, with schools, high-rise buildings. Um, but this, this wall system here is standard throughout all, all companies. So it's easy to roll out the same model throughout the, the country. Uh, basically, what we can do is we insulate in the factory. We factory fit our VCL. We factory fit additional insulation if you want to lower the U value again, down as low as sort of 0 0.09. And you've got your uh, service pattern. So basically, the wall lands, you're ready for your first fix and ready for your plasterboard straight after that. Um, obviously, you can enhance plasterboard, especially in uh, social housing, to have a much more durable product on the, on the wall that can take a bit more of a, a bang. So I think you guys need about 40 years maintenance on, on social housing. So it's, um, there's ways to enhance the product, keeping costs low, and rolled out across the country in the same design. Um, party walls are very important. Everyone in the industry has to build them this way. There's no real flexibility now. The fire testing is done to this wall. It has to be fire ready, basically, when the wall lands um, on site. So there's no worries during construction of a fire starts for whatever reason that the, each unit is basically safe. Um, TTFC do a modular panel system is what we call it. Basically, we go one step further than the system I've just shown you. We factory fit a high density plasterboard. It's, it's, a, it's a chip rock product, it's a rigado board. So basically, that's about four times stronger than standard plasterboard. You can screw kitchen units, curtain poles, frames, anywhere you want in the house without having to find a stud using that board. Now also what we do is we uh, factory fit a 25 mil round conduit ready for fire fixed wiring. So basically the wall lands, put your wire up, put your back box in, the wall is ready to skim. Basically you can save two to three weeks per unit using this compared to the other timber frame system on your program. And again, nearly double that, even more on block work uh, construction. Um, again, internal walls then are insulated as well as slabs in the factory. So again, the walls are there, they're landed ready to skim. Party walls have to be built the same way as the previous uh, versions I showed you. So basically all your plasterboard is fitted, your VCL is there, your, your insulation is there for sound. So it covers your thermal, fire, as well as acoustic performances on the party wall. Um, this is just a quick quick video, I'm not sure what, where I am on time. Um, James, just over a minute to go. Just over a minute, we'll skip this one. That's, all, that's well over a minute. These are two case studies. Um, this is a development we've done, it's a private development up in uh, West Mees. So basically the insights into this is basically, there's 50 houses on the site. We've done the first 22. They're all A1 rated, they all meet the NZ requirements. They're all air to heat, water heat pumps. They've got uh, the solar photovoltaic uh, panels on the roof. So basically what they're aimed for and they're achieving is heating and hot water and ventilation bill is basically zero every month. Um, creeps up in the winter sometimes, but basically these houses, I've been in them, they're actually, they're available to actually go visit. Um, some of the show houses are still available to go have a look at. So basically this is our modular panel system. So that we're doing two or three more units during the rest of this year. Um, so these were very easily achieved using timber frame. Again, this is the development we did for, I think the end client was NAMA. These are 75 units in Carrick Mines in Dublin. Again, air to water uh, heat pump, um, and they have the photovoltaic panels on the roof. Again, all meet NSEP requirements. I mean, you're talking 30 to 50 euro a month bills, electricity, hot water, heating. That's where you want to be. Um, that's what you want to build. The systems are there in place, and it's, it's simple to achieve. Um, basically, the only bit of concrete you can, you have to use, especially in this development here, the concrete slab, the rest of it is basically built using off-site construction materials. The external wall was a batten and render board on the outside. So there's no block work. The only wet trays then were the plastering and skim. And this is just a short video. I can cut this off if needs be. This is the 16 units we've done in uh, Essex, uh, all social housing. Um, basically we put 16 units up in 10 days. Um, this is using our modular panel system. So windows and doors are fitted. 
all the boards internally to your walls, uh, internal walls, external walls, and party walls, all fitted. It's all there, ready to go. So it makes construction much quicker. In two weeks, you have 16 units up. So the rollout is, and the potential for the rollout is, is massive. Um, and it's there for all to see, really. Um, we've got plenty of case studies and projects across the UK and Ireland to, to view. We've got a few case studies on the website if you want to have a look and a few more videos, including the one above, which I think I ran out of time. Um, James, if so, you could just wrap up, thank you very much. Yeah, perfect. Um, this is basically our manufacturing unit in the in, in, in Wexford that you can see there where we have about, we have, we have anywhere between 30 and 40 guys, but we're building back up at the moment due to the shutdown. But um, basically everything is offsite manufactured. It's very important to um, get the system right for you guys to roll out for, amongst all manufacturers, not just ourselves, obviously. So you can build as many as, as eight, 10, 12,000 a year of, of, of timber frame across Ireland is what I believe the capacity can be, if not more. Um, that's it, thanks very much. Any questions, just leave them in the chat, as the lad said, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the show. That's brilliant. That's great. Thanks very much, James. The presentations will be available, so your your videos there will be in your presentation, and um, so w when they're sent round, everybody can can watch them. But thanks very much for your Thank you. your presentation there. Thanks, James. Okay, next up, uh, Paul Glavin, please from Glavlock. If you'd like to, Paul, uh, share your screen there. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see that? No, Hello? not yet. Yes, I. Yes. It's there, is it? No. Right, can you see that? No. Not yet, Paul. Okay, I'll try it again. Yep, that's, uh, we can see your... Perfect. Uh, my diary. That's <laughs> it, yeah. Perfect, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, okay, I think we're good to go there, are we? Uh, everyone, you can see it okay. Um, okay, first of all, my name is um, Paul Clavin from um, Clavlock Building Technology. Um, I suppose uh, my presentation today, it'll be uh, it's obviously quite brief given the time, but I just wanted to go through, I suppose, our journey of developing a new system that is, while it is timber frame, it's very much an alternative to... I suppose the traditional timber frame from the point of view of the compliance and the way we've done it um, and also the digital the digital aspects of the way we manufacture modularization of the system so I suppose I just got to very quickly um, go through why we developed what we did and, uh, and what was the metric we used to develop it and the methodology we started with a completely clean sheet we did not try to comply with IS 440 which is the traditional timber frame directive we decided to go down the route of um, an NSAI Agreement Cert instead. Um, most people will be aware of what that is, but effectively it allows you to comply by alternative means with regulations, uh, both in Ireland and across Europe. Um, so I suppose the first thing we did uh, five or six years ago is try to identify the problems are in the industry. Um, typical uh, problems are, uh, are, are, are fairly well known, um, sorry, are fairly well known, inefficient construction, environmental issues, lack of common standards, and you've heard these uh, there from other speakers, um, timelines, cost volatility, et cetera. So when we started developing out this system um, over five years ago, we wanted to, I suppose, the main underlying thing that we wanted to do was reduce the cost of the system compared to what was, I suppose, the standard masonry construction, which is still, I suppose, the, has the lion's share of the market. And there was only, there was, a small, there was not that many ways to do that by using traditional timber frame methods. And there's a lot of very good systems out there. Look, my own background is a structural engineer. I've designed timber frame for multiple companies, ICF systems, and they're all absolutely superb systems. But what we found is that for the mass produced market, which is what we were targeting, is that in order to actually compete with the, I suppose, what we call more the bog standard uh, construction methods, the price point was very, very sensitive. And it was hard to bring in the standards that we wanted that would be kind of, you know, A1 passive compliant at that price point or below. So we were also looking for, for example, 40% improvements on the thermal efficiencies. We wanted to increase fire resistance. Again, we didn't want to be using HMS and sockets or any of that. We wanted uh, services to be able to be retrofitted to buildings afterwards without compromising uh, fire testing. 
Um, and we would have spent an awful lot of time um, in the BRE test centres actually in Watford and a number of these tests um, we're very familiar with it, as um, I think John would have mentioned earlier. Again, another thing there, we wanted stronger frames. We wanted 80% Irish timber possible. The vast bulk of timber that goes into timber frame, unfortunately, from, uh, is not Irish because Irish timber, timber is inherently, I suppose, weaker than traditional timber. C14, C16 is probably the best you get for the most part. Most timber frame systems require kind of a C24 or something above that. Um, again, environmentally friendly production, zero waste. And really the only solution to actually hit the targets was to use, I suppose, lean manufacture, which is very scalable and will keep our costs down. Obviously low skill installation was also a requirement given the restrictions. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about lean manufacture um, of our product. So our product is very much component based is the first thing. So, and I'll get onto that maybe in a later slide. But what we wanted to do is rather than design a machine to make a house or um, a building system, we want to design a system for off the shelf, relatively inexpensive machinery, such as the, the, the large CNC machine you see on the right hand side there. And we've um, one or two of those in, in, in our main factory floor. Um, simple design manufacturing processes, you know, design simple logistics support and also the software systems support. It's all very well having a really nice system. You need to also take the pressure off the office uh, in order to, to maximize scalability, et cetera. So the benefits of going down the lean manufacturer is obviously you get a much, much more scalable production and um, stabilization of quality, zero waste, and very efficient manufacturing processes. And um, I suppose in Gladlock, we try and use what we call our six touch manufacturer process. And that simply means from product coming in raw materials such as boards to product going out requires six touches. So for example, uh, remove, unloading the truck is one, um, loading the machine with um, pallet of um, OSB is another, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, until it goes onto the truck to leave the factory again. Um, I suppose just worth noting that the lean manufacturing, the way we, our methodology means that we can produce over 100 houses per employee on the floor. So we only have two people on a floor at any one time, and they have the capability to produce over 300 houses a year if necessary in component form via, um, OS, uh, via, or via CNC machines. Apologies. Just to give you a little bit of an understanding, and I appreciate it's a very short time frame uh, on this presentation. You can see on the main picture there, um, uh, the type of components I'm talking about is very much a, like a Lego kit is probably the best way to describe it, a Meccano. There's between 12 and 20 standard components, all made out of OSB. Um, most of the vast bulk of it made by Creelta down in Waterford and uh, Smart Life. Uh, all the insulation is cut. Now we do use EPS and people will question why we use that, but um, I don't have time to cover that in this presentation, but there's a very good reason for it. Um, it's simply clipped together in more of a stick build format rather than a closed panel system that we'll be more familiar with. Um, you can see, you know, there's a, wind, a frame in there. We normally don't need steel. The frame itself is about four times stronger, so it can go up to three to four stories. It can take concrete floor shelves, for example, without reinforcement. The other interesting thing about it, I suppose, is it is fully certified for external insulation and external renders. The frame does not need ventilation um, that you would normally, I suppose, associate with timber products um, due to the way we've done it. Effectively, the timber frame is at the inside, but there's no terminal bridging of the actual timber frame. Um, uh, and also obviously the cold bridge coefficients are extremely low for that reason. There are some of our standard details now the ones here show masonry, but equally you can see the insulation, uh, external insulation on the outside pre-fitted. Uh, again, metal web joists can be used. You can use concrete slabs, whatever you want to. We use a double standard 12 and a half mil board with a 25 mil service cavity as standard. Now we've conducted as well again all our own fire tests and this arrangement gives us over 60 minutes of um, fire resistance, regardless of how many services are in the actual wall. All our tests um, in Watford would have had at least six double generic plastic sockets. I, suppose I just want to talk a little bit about the certification because, again, you know, bringing a new product through the, um, uh, you know, from I suppose concept to patents, um, it's very difficult when you're approaching I suppose uh, I suppose established state bodies with new technology. There's only one way to do it, and that's really to over-certify and over-hit all the metrics. You know, as I said, the structure, the thermals, etc. Uh, to prove that you know your system is compliant and that it's worthy of an agreement cert and other certification. And so we're very lucky we've for two long years um, getting uh, through the NSA agreement process. Um, I think we're the only timber based system in the country uh, with an agreement cert. Uh, we're not part of the uh, Timber Frame Association um, uh, for this reason. And um, we've gone down this alternative route. Getting Member of Engineers Ireland, um, BRE, you we'll see mentioned there, we've spent an awful lot of time in the BRE test centre in Watford. They've been very, very good to us. Um, we have SDA UK gold certification on, on our products as well. 
we're in the final um, part of getting um, homebound approval due and we're hoping that in place in the next number of weeks. Again, that's another milestone for I suppose, a very new technology um, to get through the process with more established, maybe more traditional uh, a company like homebound who are more used to maybe traditional build um, techniques. Again, I mentioned the fire tests already. Acoustic tests, we put an awful lot of time and effort into. And again, because we're constrained by maybe IS440, um, we were able to do things uh, differently and try out lots of different uh, options without um, having to be restrained by um, maybe more traditional methodologies. Just a little bit to touch on, I suppose, digital design blocks. Um, we've, I suppose, designed all our um, products into, um, into Rivet smart blocks. Um, all of them, uh, they're in beta testing at the moment with a number of architects. So, for example, if an architect downloads these blocks, puts them together, they automatically get the costing information, they get the environmental information, um, and they, um, you know, structural information will be following shortly. And we're working, I suppose, in the early stages of creating a common platform that will eventually be uh, on our website where all this information will be downloaded and in real time, pricing, structural requirements, etc. All this data can be downloaded directly by the architect without actually coming near any of our technicians, specialists, engineers, or the office. And again, what that has to do is make our products extremely scalable from the point of view of rolling them out. Um, in the mass market, which is really our target market, to get to that price point in order to compete, I suppose, in, the, in what you call maybe the, the, the lower end of the mass market from a quality point of view. Um, I just showed that. Perfect. I just put in this slide here quickly. It's a small development in Navan of uh, four social houses. Um, again, you might just see in the lower middle slide there, the archway, that is the only entrance to the site. Um, so again, I suppose bringing stuff in in standard component form, you can see them laid out there. Um, the frame for this, on average, took uh, for the four buildings, I think, was up, including walls, in about um, in, in about a week or so. Um, there was obviously a little bit of lugging and loading due to the fact that could get machinery in there. I'll just leave you with two um, uh, slides. One again is in Carrick Mines. Um, it's just a standard one-off house. It's one of the two passive houses we did in Carrick Mines. Uh, again, we put in. There's a lot of services in there. One of the benefits of using, I suppose. A super warm system with the external installation is we found that all this really was redundant in um, in monitoring over the last year or two and what we found is that you know a much smaller heating system therefore cost savings can be realized by maybe getting rid of the underflow heating and other expensive options that aren't really required and um, having tested that building sorry apologies uh, just again another um, uh, job we did it's only a small extension in Cork because of the modularization of our system and the standardized components it means you know big projects and small projects are just as easy to do because everything is pre-manufactured in component form. As I said, think Lego, think Meccano. You just pick off the components you want, um, and you can design whatever you want to do. So that's just a very, very brief uh, overview of the type of stuff we've done and the journey we've been on uh, in developing out new technology. Um, and if you know, there's any questions after, I'd be delighted to answer them. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, everyone's doing very well sticking to the time. Of course, Michael is very good at uh, jiggling us all along as well. So thanks, Michael. Um, up next, we have uh, David Gall from uh, BRE. So, um, Paul, if you could stop sharing your screen, please. And um, David, you can share your screen. Okay, that should be coming onto your screens now. Yep, I can see. Yep, excellent, David. We can see that. Yeah, Thank okay you very much. That? Yep. Yep. Okay, I'll I'll crack on then. Um, and I mean, a little, little bit like Paul's presentation, I, I could normally spend at least half an hour to an hour um, talking about this, although, although admittedly 10 minutes is probably better because if I spent half an hour, you'd probably be asleep at the end of it. But I'm, I'm David Gould and I work as a colleague with John White, who you heard from um, at the beginning of these presentations. Um, I've been helping John set up the uh, Notify Body Office in Dublin, but the, uh, the, the sort of the scope of BRE Global in Ireland generally. Um, as a result of the, the, the Brexit movement in the UK. Um, and part of what I've been doing as well in parallel to all of that uh, is to develop a standard, a BRE standard for um, offsite construction. Um, at the moment, this is a, a standard which is specifically for, for dwellings, for, ha for homes, for housing. Um, and we will expand it um, after in, in due course to other um, areas at other sectors for off-site manufacture. But this is really a, a standard that requires testing and assessment, a bit like some of the folk that have presented this morning. Um, they've had testing done already. 
Um, and then certification also is something that we would provide on the basis of, of developing this standard. So we've developed um, this BRE standard. Uh, okay, next slide. On the basis of a project that was set up in the UK um, by the UK government a few years ago, really for the purpose of um, helping to, to, to shorten the, the housing gap within the UK. I mean, depending on what statistics you um, you choose to see, there's there's a huge number of um, homes that are required, certainly in the UK. And, and I understand in Ireland, there is also a, a sort of a housing shortage. And it's um, perceived that um, offsite manufacture, offsite construction can help to reduce that housing deficit by, uh, by quite a margin. In this case, the project was um, hoped to shorten the gap by at least 10,000 homes a year once the manufacturers can scale up to, to large-scale production. And so really, why do we need a standard? Um, there's, there's really, in terms of off-site manufacture, the, the UK particularly, the, the homeowners in the UK are a very conservative bunch, um, very traditional, and so anything that's not built out of bricks and mortar is perceived as being almost alien to, 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 to everybody. Um, but there's also a fallback to um, after the Second World War when a lot of um, prefabricated homes were, were put up um, as a result of trying to build homes quickly um, after all the destruction and, and off-site manufacture in, in the early days, if you like, was seen as a way of doing that. So panelised systems were used immediately after the war. And a lot of them were sort of dark, dingy homes and, and sort of knocked down fairly quickly afterwards. Some are still standing, in fairness, but there's this perception of off-site construction now that, that harps back to those that, to, to that era. And, and there's also a lot of negative, um, there's a negative connotation in the press um, around off-site construction, that it's almost cheap and, and there's terms here that refer to prefabricated and prefab housing, in effect. And I know a few of you have touched upon sort of the Lego or IKEA models in, in your previous presentations, and that's very much the perception um, that I find we come across with uh, off-site construction. So our standard is designed around removing that um, that connotation. Um, and as I say, certainly we've we've got a tough market in the UK. You can have, for example, these are just examples of manufacturers where you could have um, a manufacturer in a Scandinavian country there, that, that photograph on the left, um, an overtly timber timber product there, timber modular building. Um, it's not hiding the fact that it is, uh, it, it's a modular construction and then the same manufacturer could try to build um, and, and install their products within the UK, but they have to design it and uh, have sort of different facades and the like to make it look like a bricks and mortar type construction. So by having a, a standard for modular homes and trying to get rid of that negative stereotype for, for off-site construction, we decided that we had to um, go um, along the, the route of a normal standards development process that involves many, many people within that stakeholder process, all the way through from the manufacturers, the designers, building control, warranty providers, and, and especially people like mortgage, companies like mortgage lenders. All of them have to really buy into the concept of offsite construction in order for offsite construction to be wanted and to be used. So there's no point in a manufacturer building something if at the end of the day somebody can't get a mortgage on it, for example, or the, the warranty, let the, the insurers won't um, do, do put insurance on it. So we, we've really consulted through this process what we think of as the whole industry sector here for offsite. And we split it into six. The, the box on the right there shows you the six um, sort of working groups that we developed through the development of the standard. All the structural, acoustic, sustainability and the like. But it was seen by an overarching panel of offsite industry experts. So we wanted to make sure that although you have specialists in fire or sustainability, for example, you also had experts specifically in, in modular off-site construction who, who had the sort of the final say of what came out of the working groups to develop the standard. And so within the standard, and I think just talking across to John, we can provide a link um, to you all after this for getting hold of a copy of the, the, the standard as it is, so you can see the contents of it. 
and um, these these are sort of the key parts that, that are contained within the standard particularly picking up on the aspects of sort of digital digitalized construction here and, and the supply chain for the purpose of this workshop we we've incorporated elements of BIM so a little bit like the BRIAM um, sustainability uh, scheme we have um, extra requirements in there for BIM and so if you do practice BIM and certain categories levels of BIM level threes and twos for example then you do sort of get extra credits for doing that um, equally, um, Tag and Track is a system that we've helped to develop with some of our other colleagues within BRE, and this is very much a supply chain system. Some of you may know this under certain different other names, but it really tracks incoming goods um, and through the supply chain network into the factory and then back out the other end of the factory once the products are made. So in this case, for example, a supplier may do batch testing of their timber frames, just picking up on the theme of today. And so they might have batch test results that go into an electronic system, which also tells the manufacturer when these products are going to arrive in their factory so that everything can be assembled. Once it's all assembled, there'd be a QR code on the modular building itself. And that will in effect link back to the, the, the sort of the batch control um, results that you might have loaded into it at the front end for your timber frame, for example, should you want to see it. Within this, of course, um, there's a lot of um, emphasis on sustainability and comfort. Now, um, as I say, if you go back to the, the post-war um, prefab housing, very, very uncomfortable, dark and dingy places to live in. Nowadays, modular construction, I believe, is much, much better. And, and um, really, if you ever go into a modular building, you, you know, you'd be quite or, or inspired, hopefully, of, of the fact that it, you wouldn't know that it was a, 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 an off-site um, manufactured product. So comfort is important, and that comfort could sort of link across to sustainability in terms of thermal comfort and, and general well-being so sort of lots of daylighting and the like they're not dark and dingy places to live they're actually a really nice pleasant environment to live in and, and so briefly the um, part of the requirement that we've incorporated in the standard is is what I would call basic minimum compliance requirements and and that is combined with um, building regulations so by complying with this standard 7014 you will also de facto be complying with certainly UK at the moment building regulation but it also covers the seven basic works requirements of the construction products regulation so if you were making a product for sale within the European Union anyway you would have to be considering how you comply with all of these seven requirements anyway so we're ticking a box with building regulation we're ticking a box with the construction products regulation for example and what I would say is that all of these seven requirements are very basic but very fundamental requirements for any any construction so or any construction product but particularly for, for um, buildings for, for, for dwellings all of these make a lot of sense to have these aspects considered when you're when you're making and using a, a home or a modular building in this case David one minute Thank you. What makes this different particularly is that there are elements in here that um, go above and beyond industry norm. We've developed three dimensional testing. So racking, fire and acoustics particularly make sure that you get those extra levels of comfort so that when you walk across the dining room floor, for example, the cutlery on the table doesn't vibrate and rattle those sort of annoyance factors. The standard is agnostic as far as materials. You can have any, any type of um, construction, steel frame, concrete um, panels or, or, or timber, for example. And then I'll use this as my final slide just to wrap up. Um, the certification scheme will be like any construction product certification scheme, really a combination of testing, a combination of the way the constancy of the way the product is made. So an ISO 9001 quality management system or similar. And all of that wraps up into the formal certification, which would be a global, a BRE global certificate. And I think I'll leave it there. Perfect, that's great. Thank you very much, David um if you can perfect just stop sharing your screen that's great thank you very much david uh so our next speaker is joe fitzgerald from ecological building systems so joe if you'd like to share your screen please i will indeed just a reminder to everybody too uh, there are some great questions coming through so there's a chat group there so please put your questions in 
now you should have my screen there. Yeah, we can see you there, Joe. Thanks very much. Thank you. That, that's great, Alex. And thank you, Tracy, for the opportunity to speak today. I'll just get the slideshow going here. Okay. So my name is um, Joe Fitzgerald. So I'll just go back a slide there. And I work for Ecological Building Systems as a technical support engineer for about uh, three years now. And Ecological essentially are practically pioneers in airtightness in Ireland and the UK. And over the course of two decades, we've we've been expanding our own experience um, in different regions really to do with energy efficiency, low carbon design, what we would consider to be healthy living, and the prevention of the defects that we're all familiar with in traditional Irish homes, etc. So as I said, they're a great company to work for and every day with ecological business systems is like, a, is like a school day, but we do see the way the industry is heading as fitting well with what we do in our company. Take a look at NZ, for example, and in line with what Ralph asked me to speak about today as well, we would see NZ very much as a step in the right direction. For example, the improved U values that we're all aware of, the highest quality windows and doors, air tightness is getting better, and as a result, um, air quality will get better as well because of the provision of ventilation that goes hand in hand with that. But of course, we've only made a small jump from A3 to A2. So until 2019, we were required to get A3, and A3 is a very low energy building. Now we're required to get A2, and that's just a little bit better, 10% approximately. But where do we go now that we're at A-rated buildings? I suppose, you know, as the energy demand of a building drops and the operational energy gets less and less and less, it does shine a light then primarily on what the building is made of. Because if we're scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of operational energy, we must now look to the, what, to the building itself and the materials that are used within it. So that doesn't mean we stop with the building fabric, there's still work to do. And we would see Passive House as a really good roadmap to show us you know, how it can be done because of the resource efficient uh, principles that really means you will end up with low operational energy and very low embodied co2 as a result it's basically because it it focuses primarily on the fabric first and foremost it allows designers to carefully select their materials during the planning phase uh, build quality is always assured and energy efficiency is is the measured outcome healthy buildings um, due to the quality of the air and the materials selected low ecological impact that can be accounted for during modeling, ultra low energy demand, and of course, modeled carbon intensity using relevant standards like uh, BREAM and LEED and BN15978. Um, I mean, there's, there's different methodologies, but it, it gives you a, a roadmap to, to account for the carbon intensity of the buildings that we occupy, which is very important, of course, because according to a UN global status report in 2018, about 39% of global carbon emissions are related to the housing sector. Now, 28% of that is supposed to be the operational energy. And as I said, we're, we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel there, going from A3 to A2 and beyond. So that means the other 11% should be a primary focus moving forward. Because if we do ignore that, it has been referred to in a paper by Anthony Park in 2019 as the blind spot of the construction industry. And if we leave it out, then we're missing half the equation to tackle climate change in the building sector. So we would see that uh, like a combination of using materials that are sourced from renewable sources or recyclable material or reusable material, using combination of that combined with a low carbon build method like timber frame, CLT, and efficient construction methodology like off-site modular construction works very, very well in getting us to where we need to go. Just to put some of it into context, when we consider that you know hemp can sequester 13 kilos of CO2 per meter cube of hemp grown, or that essentially timber per weight is about 50% carbon. And when we design our buildings to last 50 to 100 years and longer, there's a great opportunity to lock a lot of carbon within the building fabric itself in a healthy and sustainable manner. That's where the building industry really needs to go moving forward. Likewise, using materials like uh, cellulose insulation and wood fiber, where the wood fiber will be sourced from sustainable, sustainably managed forests, um, cellulose is 
it contains more recycled material than anything out there. Um, thermal break solutions like Bozig Phonotherm more or less rescue landfill death and poly polyurethane materials uh, and put them to practical use back in our buildings. These are the types of things that we've gained in experience over two decades, but that work great in combination with timber frame and modular, modular construction. So as I said, NZ, I love this phrase by uh, Dr. Richard, Richard O'Hegarty in UCD, and he, he spoke at an NZ conference um, just before the lockdown. And he spoke about, you know, how NZEB is, is obviously a positive step because up until November the 1st in Ireland, if we take air tightness as one performance aspect of buildings, but it's a very important one, it's crucial. Up until November the 1st, our buildings were allowed to leak seven cubic meters of air every hour for every meter squared under fan conditions. So essentially, we were allowed to build sieves. Um, there, was, there wasn't really much, you know, heat retention in that situation. It doesn't matter how good your insulation is. If your building can't hold it, you get out. But NZ came along and it pushed us to go that bit better. But it's still not as good as it could be. And that building is so leaky at that stage, even at five, that natural ventilation is still allowed. Your hole in your wall is still allowed at that situation. So really where you need to be pushing it is towards the passive house standard, which is far, far more onerous. But with good reason, when we think of how air tightness is really a low hanging fruit of very energy efficiency. And to, to illustrate that, I'll show you my colleague's house, who, who's actually in the crowd here today, Niall. Niall's a good cabin man, so money is very important to him, but it's, it's also very important to the rest of us as well. And Niall built a lovely house in 2019 to the NZ standard. And, but he pushed it much, much further. And that's, his experience would have told him to do so, but there's good reason for that, because when we zoned in on his airtight value, and now you got 0.4 air changes per hour in this building. But if we just focused on air tightness, without changing the insulation levels, his great windows and doors, his zero thermal bridging, and his state-of-the-art air to water heat pump, if I just make his building leakier, under a given set of conditions, it is possible that now you could be spending 1,400 euro more per year just because his building cannot hold the heat. So air leaking from your building directly translates to money leaking from your pocket. Um, of course, air tightness is quite simple. It's one of those easily integrated elements. And, and I've seen some of the speakers today talking about offsite vapor control elements, things like that. So it's very, very easy. And really, the only thing to remember is to keep the, the materials as high quality as possible because of where they lie within your building. They'll always lie behind your final finishes. And if your building is intent on surviving 50 to 100 years, then these materials should be no different. So for example, Proclima are the only um, membrane supplier that have tested the performance of their membranes under a European technical assessment for 50 years or more. And the tapes have been undergoing accelerated aging tests for 100 years or more. So you need that level of assurance that they're not going to let you down because of where they lie in the building, given that they're such a crucial component and such a low hanging fruit. Joe, one minute. Thank you. And just to finally wrap up really, um, in summary, this graph appeared in Bringing Embodied Carbon Up Front, which is a World Green Building Council report this year. And uh, if you follow the graph from left to right, what you can see is that as you move away from your planning and design decisions into the construction and operation phase, your opportunity to re reduce carbon gets less and less. So this model by 3CEA is excellent because it's very positive to see this type of initiative where, where construction methodology, the building fabric and the planning and design decisions is really, really efficient and maximizing efficiency in every way. So it should be applauded in every, in every aspect. So that's it really. We, we do have a big technical team in, in me and we also have a team in the UK, but we welcome anybody coming to speak with us or getting in touch directly. We also have a new website that we launched recently with plenty of good information. If anyone would like to get in touch directly, feel free to do so. I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, excellent. You stopped uh, sharing the screen. Excellent. And we're bang on time. So our last speaker for this morning uh, is Susan McGarry from Ecosem. So Susan, if you'd like to share your screen, please. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, you should have that now. Yep, perfect. We can see that. That's great. Thank you.
and yeah so that's in presentation mode now yeah um so hello everybody uh, thank you for having me on today um i work for ecosem ireland i'm the my name is susan mcgarry i'm the the managing director um, I've worked for the company for the past 10 years, so I'm, I'm well used to doing these presentations. My previous roles were mostly based around sustainability, so uh, today's workshop is um, very topical for me. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm following on from uh, Timber Frame Solutions, and I'm here talking about cement. Um, but hopefully uh, my presentation will give you an idea of how to make uh, the how to make your concrete portion um, of building as sustainable as possible. Um, so just about Ecosem itself, it's an Irish owned company. We've Ecosem Group, uh, we're, it's, it's quite large across Europe. We've got uh, manufacturing plants in Dublin, Holland and France, and we've got import terminals in Sweden and the UK. Um, and as a group, we produce about 2.4 million tonnes of GGBS per year. Um, just to explain what GGBS is, so GGBS is the, the white powder you see in the picture there. Um, it is a type 2 addition and it is a byproduct from the steel industry. So it's a, basically a cement replacement so you can remove a portion of your traditional, um, traditional Portland cement and replace it with GGBS. In the Irish Concrete Standard, EN 206, uh, up to 70% GGBS is permitted with a SEM1 or a SEM2. And so just to explain how it works, in a typical cube of concrete, you could have anywhere like roughly kind of an estimate of 300 kilos of ordinary port and cement in a traditional mix. But when you bring GGBS in, you're basically going to half that. So you're going to have 150 kilos of GGBS and 150 kilos of OPC. Um, so that is the idea behind it. Um, as I said, you can go up to 70%, but uh, the most common mix would usually be 50-50. How it's produced, it comes from the steel industry, as I said. So uh, a blast furnace, into the blast furnace goes iron ore and coke and some limestone, and that's burnt to um, pretty high temperatures. And at the bottom is the iron that the steel industry want, and on top, uh, what comes out is impurities, and that is the slag. It gets quenched with water jets um, to um, granulate it, and then it's basically like a very coarse, wet sand that can be stored outside. So that's granulated blast furnace slag, and we have sources all around Europe. We have long-term supply agreements with the steel industry. So we ship that over to Ireland and we dry it with gas just to remove the moisture and we grind it using electricity in a ball mill. Um, and that's it, it produces ground granulated blast furnace slag and it's ready for collection. So it's a very low energy um, product compared to traditional Portland cement manufacturing. Um, so the reason why GGBS is used is uh, threefold. There's architectural properties, um, technical properties and then obviously environmental advantages to it. So I'm just going to start with the, the technical side of things first of all. Um, so in terms of mechanical performance, the, um, the big kind of characteristic that's known about GGBS other than it's, it's low carbon is that it can have a lower early age setting time. So this graph here is showing you setting times from um, no GGBS all the way up to 70% GGBS. So this is in lab conditions. So as you can see that the setting time can be extended, but it's not by a massive amount. You're talking kind of um, extra hours rather than extra days. Obviously, it depends on the application. Um, we usually find when we're engaged with, um, with engineers or clients that really want uh, to lower the carbon of the, the product, um, making the, the lower early age um, strength known to them at the start um, makes it basically they can, they can change their schedule. Um, and ensure that the formwork is left up long enough. There's never really any issues with it. So we kind of say that up front, GGBS is great. It lowers the carbon, it's great technically, but the setting time can be a little bit longer and it's making the, the early age strength um, a little bit lower. So for rapid construction only really is that, that's kind of where that's gonna be an issue. Um, in terms of strength development over time, uh, the blue on this graph here is your uh, typical SEM2 mix. Um, and then 30% GGBS in orange and 50% GGBS in gray. So as you can see at seven days, these are seven day concrete cube tests, uh, the gray, the 50% GGBS there is a little bit lower at your seven day test. But then 28 days, your typical compressive um, strength test for concrete and we're on a par with ordinary cement and then it continues to develop strength 
long after ordinary Portland cement has stopped. Um, so there's uh, several case studies done where GGBS concrete G with GGBS included has doubled its strength over its lifetime. So if you want um, a long service life, GGBS is, um, is particularly good. In Ireland, there's a, a separate um, derogation in the concrete standard that allows you to use a 56 day compliance cube when you've got 50% GGBS in it. The, the 28 day measurement of strength in concrete is it's, it's just a, a kind of nominal figure. 28 days was picked uh, to, to show the full strength of the concrete. Whereas if you measure it at 56 days, you're going to see really what the GGBS has done and, and see what that long term strength is. Um, a second kind of side of the technical advantages will be the durability. Um, so GGBS kind of makes a denser cement uh, matrix. So the, the chlorides can't exactly penetrate in as easily as they would with ordinary Portland cement, um, which just basically gives it a longer lifespan. Uh, time to corrosion is extended uh, for reinforcement. This is particularly good for any um, construction work done in exposed environments. Um, particularly along kind of coastal areas. Sulfate and acid resistance then is a big one, uh, especially in kind of urban environments. You saw the likes of brownfield sites where you'd have a lot of sulfates in the soil. Um, you need particularly high sulfate resistance in your concrete foundations. GGBS can provide that and it's at no extra cost. So um, typically sulfate resisting Portland cement uh, would have been used for, for brownfield sites or high sulfate um, soils. Um, whereas that, the use of sulfate resistant Portland cement has basically been eradicated now because uh, GGBS performance um, is so good in these conditions. So at 66% GGBS, you have sulfate resisting um, concrete. Um, onto the good stuff, the um, embodied carbon side of things. So our carbon footprint for uh, Ecosam's GGBS is about 32 kilos of CO2 per tonne. Um, the latest figures for SEM2 from the European cement industry is uh, SEM2 is about 683 kilos of CO2 per tonne and a SEM1 is about 803 kilos of CO2 per tonne. So all three of those figures have come from environmental product declarations. So the cement industry produce industry average environmental product declarations, whereas we have our a manufacturer's uh, declaration. So we've gone um, and gotten a third party life cycle analysis of our product. Um, so the difference that replacing GGBS in your concrete can make is massive just for one, one small product. Um, as an example of this, this is kind of, when we're talking a, a much larger construction than residential, but the, the convention center in Dublin, um, I think is the best example to show kind of carbon savings. Um, so their goal with the convention center was to have a, um, the world's first carbon neutral convention center. Um, the OPW had specified a hundred year design life on this. It was also built along the docklands in Dublin where there was really, really bad ground conditions, um, high sulfates in the soils. Um, so 70% GGBS was specified um, for those technical reasons and then also to lower the CO2. So a total of 11,000 tons of CO2 was saved uh, by just using G GGBS in the concrete. Um, so there's 50% used in the superstructure and 70% used in the sub uh, substructure. Um, those kind of savings has, has led to a change in uh, government kind of uh, government specifications. So just as an example, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Health, Infrastructure Ireland and Public Works all have a specific line in their specifications for concrete to use GGBS. Um, and a lot of the development plans for local councils also have specified the use of GGBS or equivalent in their uh, development plans. In terms of how to specify GGBS, I'm not going to read this out to you, but this is typically uh, the wording of, um, that needs to be added to your concrete spec to include GGBS. So the last sentence along the bottom that a SEM3A or SEM3A equivalent comprising 50% GGBS should be used in all applications. Um, so that's all you need to include basically to, to change your spec over to low carbon cement. This just illustrates that GGBS can be used everywhere. We're, we're beyond concrete now. We have quite a, a serious innovation team working across Europe. Uh, we now have solutions for dry mix mortars, for renders, for screed. 
obviously ready mix concrete, precast concrete, soil stabilization. We're in, we're into tile adhesives, roof tiles, basically everything and anything that you would normally use uh, traditional cement for, you can now replace with GGBS. Um, and that's kind of a list of typical percentages. So in paving and concrete blocks are kind of up around 50%. But then we have the eco semi innovation side, um, which is what we kind of, we focus a lot of our technical team trials on. We look for partners in the industry to do trials like this, where we can get up to 90% GGBS. So you've only got a 10% traditional cement portion um, in some of these projects. In terms of availability, there can be sometimes uh, rumors about scarcity of supply. This is mostly from the cement industry, unfortunately. Uh, we have no issue with supply. As I said, we have long-term supply agreements. There's actually three sources. It's not just us. Um, some other cement companies have GGBS. Um, we manufacture in Dublin and we have customers nationwide in ready mix, precast, um, you name it. So we're always looking to speak to partners or contractors, architects, engineers, anyone that wants to know more, we're always happy to kind of engage with you and work with you from the beginning of a project all the way through to on site. Um, we've quite a, a serious technical offering. As I said, we've our innovation team and we've uh, a, a team of concrete technologists that love talking about concrete and will help you on, on any job you're working on. Um, so that's it, I'll leave it there. Uh, contact details there, but I'm sure you can get them afterwards uh, in the presentation. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you very much, Susan. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers this morning. I think uh, it's been, a, sorry. I think it's been a, a, an excellent um, rundown of exactly what's available. And, and, and just to go back to the H4O um, uh, project and philosophy and model that we're trying to introduce, um, the reduction of 60% embodied and operational carbon um, based on traditional, so uh, based on traditional builds or, or, or traditional concrete blocks, etc. Um, so from Susan there for, from Ecoset, uh, Sam, even though you're talking about concrete and you made the comment yourself there that you're you're coming you're following to timber frame um, manufacturers that and suppliers, you know that the the, the Ecosem compared to traditional concrete is is, is showing great carbon savings. Um, we have some questions uh, for. Uh, nearly all the speakers, I think. Uh, and uh, our CEO Paddy uh, is also on the on the call. So Paddy, do you want to have a few words before we move on to the questions? Sorry, Alex, I was muted there for a minute. Yeah, I just wish to thank everybody for their, uh, particularly the speakers this morning for their inputs. Um, I think we're all aware and conscious that the the embodied carbon aspect of a built environment is a significant challenge but i do feel after this morning and the presentations and, and the likes of this project where the local authorities are taking up their leadership role in terms of developing low carbon low energy solutions um, it is our ambition in the energy agency through our mission and values in our strategy to to help develop the supply chain and that's specifically what this project workshop is about today to a bring awareness to those in the, in, that are out there tackling this be it from low carbon cement through to um, modular built um, timber frame low carbon solutions so i just want to thank everybody for their uh, participation this morning in terms of the presenters and also the the over uh, significant number of you that have uh, clicked in to join this workshop we do intend to run more workshops of this nature, um, specifically in this sector as, as the project develops. And I, I remind you all to um, log on to our website and subscribe to our newsletter where you'll get regular updates of various aspects that the Energy Agency are working on across Carlisle, Kilkenny and Wexford. So not just in the built environment, but also in energy efficiency uh, tied into clean energy. So thank you all very much. Um, and thanks, Alex. Thanks, Paddy. So I'm just going to go through the um, the questions. So if our panel uh, could uh, unmute themselves, please. We, I think we've got questions for, for, for everybody. I'm just going to work through uh, my list. Uh, myself and Ralph have been working on taking the questions outside. Uh, so I'm going to go through 
the list. So if all our speakers could um, could unmute themselves, please, for the discussion. So uh, first question for Merit. Um, and I don't think it was actually up on the chat, but it's, it's come from, from elsewhere. How are you dealing with the Irish building control and certification regarding uh, the CLT? Um, the, the short answer is that we, we haven't had any projects go through the Irish uh, building control um, with CLT on. Um, they're all constructed before VCAR came into effect in, the, in Canada. Uh, they also have a certification system, but it's different. Um, I mean, it's different. It's the same, but it's di it's different. It's a different jurisdiction. But um, uh, so can't answer that question. No problem. Just a, a follow up, then, please, Merit. Uh, what was the main aim that you were trying to achieve with the designs and processes that you were you were talking about there? For example, was it fast assembly? Was it low energy? So, what was actually driving the processes for you to 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 design and build? Um, for manufacturing in the way you did? Um, okay, so the project in Canada is driven by uh, three things. Low, well, there were four design themes, um, low carbon or zero carbon. Net zero carbon was, was one of the main ones. Uh, low energy was uh, another main one. Um, providing a healthy workspace uh, and a healthy working environment was the main one. Obviously you get this with, uh, with, with, with uh, mass timber um, when it's unfinished or unclad, I should say. Um, and uh, the broader kind of um, role that the TRCA has in setting an example for uh, construction uh, in, the, in Ontario um, was, a, was, a, was the fourth one. But I think uh, those things also, uh, well, the, 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 the unstated, uh, it wasn't named, but it's a consequence of, the, of all of the projects is that the uh, speed, and I think I mentioned this in the Balayogan project, when that went up in 2000, and I want to underline this, 2010, not 2020 or 2000, not last year, but 2010, that went up a frame of three, of three and a half thousand square meters in three weeks. Um, really uh, underlined uh, the potential um, of this to, to us anyway as, as designers and the, the kind of experience of uh, being able to now accelerate with DFM, accelerate the design process means that um, the design time goes into the front end uh, so that the time on site um, can be reduced and this works irrespective of scale. So if you're building one house or if you're building you know, thousands of square meters, uh, it uh, is really effective. That's great. Thanks very much, Merit. A uh, couple of questions for James. James, uh, first question from myself, and I just, because you, you, you made a comment there on your first or second slide, um, what, what was it about, or what is it about the current building regs that are challenging for timber frame and modular build? Um, I, I suppose the, the main ones I come across on a monthly basis or care homes can't be any over one story, I suppose, without having a non-combustible floor. Now we can do a non-combustible floor, but, floor, but the additional structural elements uh, don't make it that viable. Um, on top of that then is uh, high rise buildings. Now in the UK, we do four or five, six story apartment blocks, but in Ireland, there's probably more perception about timber frame and performance in fire obviously as i said before we've, we've done extensive fire testing as an industry in the uk and ireland but in ireland anything above three stories we can only go to four and with the four story one we need a, a sprinkler system in it so it's little things i suppose will make a big difference especially apartment blocks and timber frame because you'll have apartment blocks flying up um, we, we put a six story two six story blocks up in the middle of london last year and I think that was 35 flats in total. And that was up within about four weeks, I think. So the speed is, is a major thing. But where your hands are tied, maybe the perception of building regs and people's perception on timber frame and fire, it's, it's important to get that message across that the, the, the fire, the testing's there to, to back up our construction method. But they're the, they're the main ones, high rise um, residential buildings, as well as care homes and things like that, commercial site really. I think Thank as well, you. Alex, Alex, sorry, it's John here from yeah. Beery. I think David would attest to this. The other key thing as well is structural testing of higher rise buildings. So dynamic load testing, vertical load testing is, is really, really important as well. And I think about three or four stories. And I know, David, you might, you might be able to add some comments to that as well. 
Um, yeah, um, I will. But I, I get, uh, was that James that was just speaking previously? So, so kind of linking back to James, I, I think the design of the, the structure is important. Generally, it sounds like an obvious point, but generally the higher you go with modular building, the more you rely on, say, a concrete core to the, to the um, building. So maybe up to three or four stories, you know, you can maybe get away with just building module on top of module. But if you go much higher than that, you really you know, will be building into the system a, a core, uh, a concrete core, particularly within, within the, the body of the construction. I suppose to jump back in there, I mean, the six story buildings we've done, uh, but we did allow for progressive collapse design. So basically, if you take a wall out of the ground floor, the building has to stay, stay standing. So we introduce uh, glue lamp beams uh, as a frame, especially in residential. Now in schools, we don't really get away with that. We have to have a steel frame. But as the lad said, in, in terms of if there's a commercial unit on the ground floor, things like that, a concrete frame uh, and a, plat a podium basically is uh, introduced. But basically with a lot of apartments, we, we have avoided concrete on the ground floor, unless the client wants it, I suppose. So it's, yeah, we, we, there is ways around the structural side in terms of uh, performance. Um, in progressive collapse and things like that. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Jay. Right, just jump into that. Um, just uh, it's Paul here. And Alex. Absolutely. Just, Hi, uh, Paul. Yep. Yeah, just to follow up with James. I, I think there's a lot of perception in this, uh, issues in the industry, and I suppose there are an awful lot of constraints. I mean, there's a little bit of glossing over, maybe shortcomings. If you look on Dublin, a lot of the recent issues with fire problems in buildings, they weren't actually timber buildings that were problematic. Um, you know, so it's not like the fire resistance is down to detailing. It doesn't really matter whether it's timber or masonry or concrete. If you don't have the correct detailing done, all of the building types will fail. So there's no reason that you can show the logic, the testing, as James pointed out there. You know, if you want to step outside range, you can do a fire test and prove that something works. You know, sometimes uh, I, I think some of the regulation bodies are ruled by their, their heart a little bit more than their heads at times, you know, and sometimes you just have to follow the figures and make sure that there's a regime in place to actually enforce it. And that's probably one of the big issues. We don't have a national enforcement, you know, the cler old clerical works, that type of thing, building control. It's not government uh, orchestrated. So it's very hard to have one point to sign off on different types of technology when you're trying to bring it through. And Paul, just it's David Gall again, just to pick up on your point that detailing is hugely important. Um, what I would go one step further and say is to the ins the installation is also hugely important. Yes, absolutely. You have the best detailing in the world, but unless the modules, in this case, the modules, but uh, you know, installed in the correct way, you might have fire seals missing or water seals or whatever missing which are in effect fundamental to the performance from a safety point of view to, yeah. of, of the structure. So um, one thing that BRE is looking at um, as, as a next phase is um, a certified, like a competent person's installer scheme. So you'll have um, installers that are, that are uh, sort of designated as certified to um, put modular buildings in, in, in the correct way. David, is that similar to the ESTA scheme, if you mind me asking? It is, yeah, very similar. In principle, yes. Yeah, perfect. Very, uh, very important point as well to have competent uh, in, in installers. Um, question from J. Uh, sorry, for James from Stephen Howland. Uh, with regards to the modular build, what thermal bridging factor is being achieved on site? Um, good question. It's I suppose it's down to the design of the building um, and what the client wants to achieve. Uh, obviously, we're quite flexible in what we can do, so we offer a range of uh, wall types I suppose so once we get down to sort of point 0.15 or lower U values we have a on our standard walls we have a 50 mil PIR to cut out the, the, the thermal bridging across the face of the studs um, also what's important with timber frame is is compared to say a concrete or a steel frame is the, the thermal bridging is, is a much lower factor it's it's I think steel, uh, concrete was five but maybe steel is ten times more susceptible for taking heat out of the building so uh, back to your original question, yeah, it's, it's down to what the client wants to achieve, but 50 mil PIR is what we generally have across the face of the studs to cut out the, the, the bridging, and that goes with um, roof rafters as well, things, and things like that. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, comment here from Zoe. Zoe, uh, a question for myself and a comment for myself. I'm not going to read it all out loud, but basically your question at the end is how do we express an interest? Uh, so myself and my colleague Ralph uh, Ralph Camp, who's also on the on the on the call, keeping very quiet. Ralph, this morning, 
Um, but we we will we can contact you, uh, Zoe, and um, and and and, uh, and have a chat with you after after this uh, webinar. Thank you for the comment. Uh, question also from Zoe for John uh, John uh, White, ERE. Is the Construction Innovation Hub part of the Manufacturing Technical Centre in Coventry? Uh, thanks, Zoe. I think I responded privately to her. Um, in one of my slides, Alex, I, the Construction Innovation Hub is the UK government project and the Manufacturing Technology Centre and BRE along with CDBB are one of the three parties delivering that project on behalf of the CIH. So we would work very closely with the MTC in Coventry. Great. Thank you, John. And you've, you've, you're uh, uh, contacting Zoe directly there yourself. Uh, comment and question from Robert. Robert, I'm not sure who this was aimed at specifically, but again, we were going to open it to the panel, um, to all of our speakers who'd like to answer. Uh, good to see solar PV incorporated in the timber frame project. Is there an appetite for integrated PV on rapid build projects? So rather than mounting PV on top of the slates and tiles, new solutions allow the PV to be built in at the factory. So James, Paul, perhaps question question for yourself. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the rapid build uh, scope, actually. I can't remember what was on the, I haven't priced one in a, in a couple of months. Um, but I think PV panels or renewable energy sources have to be part of any new build or any, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it needs to be part of any project, really. I don't know what Paul thinks. Um, I'll try and dig out the uh, scope yeah. from what I had last. Well, I suppose, um, I, I, I think the question there was whether it could be integrated at a, at a manufacturing stage. Also, the short answer is, is, is probably not because most, you know, when you're bringing together a building, you know, from, uh, I suppose, um, a transport point of view, you still are bringing roofs in cross form and erecting them on site, be it on the, on the ground and crane the place. So realistically, you're fitting, you know, you really are still fitting the slate or the final tile or whatever it might be on site, which means integration of systems are either one of two, either you're using um, maybe some of the very newer systems which have the photovoltaic, um, I suppose, cells built into the tile or the slate, or you're fitting them onto a frame on top of the roof. But either way, you are fitting them still on site regardless, because it's just not practical to bring out a roof of, you know, fully assembled with a, a PV panel on it. Um, unless you want to maybe modulise it to bigger segments than you currently are using. Robert, does that answer your question? And a great opportunity then for you to to to, to work and, uh, and and get integrated panels. Yeah, I think there's there's some good products out there, and uh, it'd be very interesting to work with these guys. It it just seems a shame when everything else is integrated and thought about at the beginning, to see force solar PV panels th thrown on at the end. Sl slightly uh, look, looking like an afterthought, even though they're not an afterthought. So let's work on that and let's try and make them more built in uh, and maybe even use. Uh, uh, Probably more of a specifier um, issue, really, to be honest. You know, it, it, it comes down to what's been specified by the designer. If they want them integrated, they'll be integrated into the roof. But it really, so it's not something I say that can be fitted at a factory stage, unfortunately. From my point of view, and I, I don't know whether James would agree with that, but. It's just not feasible, really, with the way the structures are put together, unless you're actually doing volumetric type construction, which may, may be slightly different. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's 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 just a, not a practical because you will it, it, things get damaged when in transport and in construction. So it's a case it needs to go on after the roof covering goes on, whether it's a flat roof or a pitched roof. I think to be fair to some specifiers and architects, they, they do think ahead and specify the right type of panels. Um, it's just it just has to go on at the end. I think is the is, is the practical way of doing it, as far as I'm I'm I'm, I'm aware anyway or concerned. Great, thank you. Uh, can I just add there? It's David Gall again. Can I just add yeah. that from when we were developing the standards, um, transportation was one aspect that we included to begin with, but then had to take out because there was so much contention about how we would physically test for that and it was deemed that perhaps the most severe test might be a lorry braking at speed for example with the whole a whole three-dimensional module on the back of it but then some manufacturers because ultimately the structures are still quite flimsy at that stage and and so fragile components within that such as pv or windows might break or tiles on bathroom pods for example might break in in during the transportation 
So I know it's something that's a big concern generally for modular manufacturers, but then I go back to my previous comment about the um, installation uh, being something that's hugely important. And if modules um, arrive on site and they're broken in some way and have to get shipped back or repaired, then any financial benefit of, of making it off site is already sort of in, in, in the negative by having to return it to the factory for rework or repair. Thanks, David. Um, next question for Paul again, Paul and, and, and James and anybody else who wants to answer it was a, a question that I had put up and again specifically re related to the housing 4.0 project because again to the, the aim of using modular uh, um, or one of the thoughts behind using modular is that it's easier to add and subtract from let's say. So my question there is due to modular design how hard or easy is it to add or remove sections when redesign is needed? And the example that, that, that I'm giving is you've got a big family house, a, a, a couple with four kids, the kids all grow up and move move out, but the family home, the parents don't want to move out the family home, but they don't need a big four bedroom house anymore. How easy it, is it to, to reduce that size by removing a modular section, for example? Yeah, I suppose there's, there's a little bit of, I suppose, a misinterpretation of, of modular I think in the industry um, I think possibly um, and what, what you'd be referring to is more you know what you're suggesting of moving removing modules making houses bigger and smaller really is you're, you're heading to make more of the volumetric type construction where you're bringing out rooms that are pre-completed in a factory environment so like for example a lot of the premier inns you now the bedrooms you know across the UK and Ireland would be would be modular and you know they're the issue in, in, in Ireland with that is that to, and even in the UK, it's to have a stable pipeline for buildings that are suitable is quite difficult. You need a huge volume uh, of them. You know, you need to be able to manufacture them by the thousands in order to build a viable company. And that's quite difficult. Now, I suppose with our own systems, it was designed and is used in modular volumetric as well as the underpinning structure in certain modules um, in Ireland, smaller structures. And that they are done in the factory, but they're done in a very, very small quantity. So, you know, when we say modular, we're referring to modular um, fabric, so modular structures. Again, probably, I'm sure James says, well, you know, you've modularized the actual wall panel, but realistically, once they're in place, you know, it's the same as a traditional built from that point of view. It's just, you're not going to reduce it realistically. You may decide to extend it, but again, you're into more traditional. You just add on another timber frame structure next to it or an extension. That would be my reading of it, as opposed to being maybe more volumetric type of construction you'd be referring to in the question. I'd, I'd go along with that, Paul, actually. It's David Gall again. Um, again, in our standard, we've allowed for the sort of extending of buildings in as much that you'd scan a, a QR code, for example, somewhere within the building, and it would tell um, the, 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 the tradespeople how to, um, what, pe what pieces are removable, for example, go, going back to Alice's comment about, say, knocking a hole in a wall, in an existing wall, to build an extension or to build, a, say, a French door or something into it. Mm -hmm. um, I've not really come across much about reducing the size of the buildings, but I, I sort of go along with what Paul's saying. What We do have some initiatives whereby the um, architects and the like have a remit to reuse the modules. So in effect, some of the some of the housing is very temporary, uh, maybe only for 12 months or, or say five years, maybe. Um, and there's a requirement in that that it you could take the module or the, the, the house from its existing uh, location to somewhere else to be used again. Yep. perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Can I say that? I say so one other thing just relates to timber and it's a timber in general and sure James will agree and, and, and others. And um, timber frame buildings are actually quite complex. They're not maybe quite the same as a masonry built where, you know, the weight of the masonry allows you maybe to remove walls and the racking resistance uh, uh, in a building. When you're designing a timber building, you know, the internal walls and the external walls kind of work as a together to form a stable structure. You can't just, you know, even if the technique may not be supporting a floor, it may be bracing an external wall. So it's a little bit more complex to repurpose a timber frame building without having a specialist timber frame engineer look at it first, just add that in. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a, a comment and question from Ellen Phelan. As, uh, I'm going to read this out, it's in the chat for everyone to read also. As per the 2017 Safest Houses A report on building standards, building controls and customer protection, will we be very slow in Ireland to bring all of these amazing building solutions to become standard? So, so, uh, 
Well, with the lack of independent building control currently at the basic level in Ireland, we are struggling with basic fire design implementation and building being built now. And as everyone is aware, this is a huge uh, issue in buildings across the country, which I think has been discussed uh, 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 a few times this morning. With the creation of a county council type lead independent building construction inspection body, give a fair playing pitch to modular homes with more traditional building techniques. So that's a big comment there, but the question there really about uh, certification, about inspection, about um, signing off really. So would a, a county council type or a lead independent building construction inspection body give a fair playing pitch? So open to the panel. Um, can I, can I, sorry, sorry, I jump in there again. Sorry to sounds like I'm hogging this this <laughs> session. But, uh, um, again, I can only really talk from a UK perspective, but um, building control inspectors are generally more than happy once you know there's um, components that they're familiar with in in a traditional build. The the problem I think comes and linking back to this question from Ellen is is around anything that's innovative um, and doesn't fit the norm. Um, that you have to almost go above and beyond to demonstrate compliance with regulation somehow. And sometimes that's difficult. You might have a fire test certificate for, say, a CLT member or something. Whereas if it were a traditional lintel, then, you know, the, the, the building inspector might be more familiar and comfortable with the use of that component within a building. So I think innovative innovative construction is is more of a problem per se because the inspectors aren't necessarily aware of its its use or of its um, credibility frankly so that that's why schemes like our standard or or, or generally sort of um industry schemes like the robust details scheme in the uk for, for certain components is is something that the inspectors can look at um, almost look at it online as in a manual or online and find that that is an approved component for example yeah alex, alex i might just add to david's comments from an irish perspective and um, the technical standard that david went through and i'll send a link on to you that you can share with everybody and um, we have sent it through to various government agencies and also the Chief Fire Office Association for feedback and guidance. Um, and I think two things from our end, I think the innovation and what we do with the innovation parks is really critical to this because unless you have something physically on the ground to show what works well, what doesn't work well and go through that proof of concept is one area that needs to be addressed. I also think the other area, um, with, and I'm, I'm conscious there may be local authorities on the call, but I think th the regulations and legislation is the same but I think that it's open to interpretation across the country as well in terms of sign off and buildings. And um, I actually believe there is a, there is a role here for a national fire authority, an overarching authority that actually oversees building control and local fire offices and have consistency in that interpretation of legislation. Whether that's achievable or not, I do not know. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, go, please, Paul. Yeah, I was just going to say, look, I suppose we would come through maybe a process, you know, which we're probably quite close, I suppose, to the, the, the kind of innovation that, you know, has to come through a, quite an, an established system from the point of view of the way we do things. We don't comply with any of the standard rates. Everything is a test. Everything is over, has to be over designed. But I would say, like, you know, it's, it's, it's the way, you know, there's two points I've made. One is the way we work. I mean, for example, we brought the uh, Cork County Fire Officer to all our fire tests in the BLE Centre to witness them. Um, as a starting point, um, just to understand what we did, to see the test in person, to watch, you know, uh, as, as kind of an independent body, you know, they're not listed, um, but just purely to bring them on board. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of it's about working with people, you can get your back up, you can fight, or you can work with people and bring them along. And what we've tried to do is, you know, like the home bond, and the, you know, there's, there's a process that has to be gone through. And you just, unfortunately, you can't bulldoze your way through it either. At times, you know, there's no defined system. And I suppose one of the things as an industry we're probably guilty of, we're not, we're not great at working together to try and drive, you know, maybe innovation in, in our industries. I suppose there's a little, you know, we're all guilty of a bit of protectionism. We're trying to, you know, work in markets that have very fine margins and can be difficult at times. Um, and sometimes, like, you know, there's not enough emphasis on, as I say, kind of technology parks. Again, like we'd integrate a lot, we work an awful lot, for example, the CIT, the joint partnership with Kingspan on a new foundation and the CIT as well. So there's a lot out there, but it has to be maybe brought together in an obvious mm -hmm. manner that we could do with from a third level industry and maybe some of the larger players who have a lot to add as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
Excellent points there. We're just at half past 11, um, everybody. So I just have two quick, quick questions if everybody doesn't mind um, hanging on. Quick question for, so there was a, there was a, a general question from Liam Donahue about um, will the recordings and presentations be available? So yes, just to, to reiterate to everybody. Quick question for Susan. Susan, um, you mentioned the eco stem and the, the length of time for the, the strength uh, of concrete in terms of using the GGBS. Can I just ask you, the prefabrication, your, your, your product is used also in, in ICF, uh, insulated concrete formwork, et cetera, and, and the prefabrication of concrete blocks, et cetera. Does that assist in the, 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 the time required? Yes, Alex, actually it does. I should have mentioned that in my presentation. So um, we, we say, always say that up front about the early age strength, but uh, with ICF, it's really not an issue because basically the, the concrete's remaining in the formwork. So it can accelerate that early age strength um, a little bit. So kind of scheduling and those kind of issues that, that it's, it's not an issue basically in that kind of construction. So it's ideal for ICF building. Perfect. Thanks, Susan. Just two quick last questions. Uh, is there any timber suppliers looking at modular, smaller than 50 square meter floor area that arrives fitted out on site for tourist or social housing solutions? There's a, a question from Paddy. So are there any timber suppliers looking at small, less than 50 square meter modular uh, floors that can arrive on site? Yeah. Again. Yeah, we, we do some small amount of volumetric. It's, it's limited though to specific requirements. So occasionally we've done some preschools where they wanted maybe more organic type buildings. And um, uh, we do some, we do, we've done some you know, small units where, you know, for example, glamping type of things where you need a fire rating on the building as opposed mm -hmm. to, which is obviously important. So we, we use a small number of, generally they tend to be the kind, if, if they're going that way, they tend to be between kind of um, you know, 20 and maybe 30 to 35 square meters max, because anything about that becomes kind of difficult to transport. And obviously there's limitations on the widths of those, okay. et cetera, and that you can use for that way. You know? okay. But that's mostly, as you say, for per perhaps um, glamping or, or garden rooms or, or something yeah, to that effect. They are, as opposed to... like they are, I suppose the big thing to remember is, you know, most, if you're buying a garden room or something like that, you know, they're, they're not designed for residential use and they're not certified for residential use. They're there for day use only. Um, so if you are looking for type of unit, that's, I think the question, the, the, the question to ask the question is, is uh, you do have to still comply with the, the, yeah. the use of residential regulation and the class of buildings. Um, and we can provide that, but they are done on a custom basis, I would say. We don't do a huge volume of them. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Last question uh, from Ralph. Ralph, uh, is there a scheme to avoid using treated wood, like constructive wood protection, where you prove that your construction is condensate-free or eventual uh, condensate can vapour without leaving damage? So again, open to the floor for that question from Ralph. I could just comment on that for a moment, but I think um, at a specification stage, leaving a construction condensation free is really, uh, you know, it, it comes down to the software that you're using to analyze whether or not the safety of the construction is there. So, you know, from what we would see more and more often, hydrothermal simulation, a dynamic simulation like the use of a woofy analysis would really provide that level of assurance, um, you know, to say that you're construction type is either safe or not, but it's usually through the use of um, third party bodies or somebody like ourselves doing or providing that service for specifiers. Thanks, Joe. Mm. Yeah, I suppose from a, from a, my point of view, the the ITFMA are kind of those kind of members. We're all, we're all tied into the IS440, so we have to treat our external studs in that in that perspective but as joe said if you have the right software to show that condensation won't be an issue then there probably is a way around it but um like to myself it's it's uh, we have to treat our external studs great okay we've just gone a few minutes over so i think that's all of all of the questions uh ralph there's a, a comment there from niall crossan directly in relation to your question that we can pick up just a big thanks again to all of our speakers this morning and a thanks to all of our participants. Um, some good questions and good discussion there. The presentations um, and the recording will be available. Mary will be in touch with everybody after this um, to send around all of the links and also to, to ask for feedback on this morning's session. So again, thank you very much for attending and we'll speak to you all soon. Thank you.